name's David Linesich. Um, I work for a company called BMT HiQ Sigma. Uh, if you haven't had an opportunity to visit our stand at the moment, it's in the Highbury Street number 30. So please take the opportunity. Um, we're a company that's involved with complex project program delivery across a number of government departments. And we sort of integrate a range of techniques from project program management and systems engineering, enterprise architecture, etc., to manage these complex programs. Um, I'm going to be talking about benefits today. Uh, my title, Benefits are Love for Life and Not Just for uh, Business Cases, is a bit of a shameless pinch of the uh, expression about dogs are for life and not just for Christmas. Um, and obviously, uh, I can't hope to appeal to your heartstrings as much today with the images of puppies, etc. Um, but I do at least hope to appeal to your, your mind, if you're not your heart, about why we need to improve benefits management. Okay, that's a little bit about me, why I'm qualified, I think, to talk about this subject. It's quite disconcerting, actually, not to be able to see the uh, screen, but it's above me. I hope you can see that there. Um, so I've been involved in, in complex programs. Um, I'm an engineer by background, systems engineer. Uh, but mostly I've been doing project program management for most of my career, uh, largely in defence and energy sectors. Uh, and actually from benefits point of view, I've been involved with benefits uh, discreetly, I guess, since uh, about 2000. I was involved in a big change program in the MOD when I tried to uh, implement a benefits tracking system uh, where I first come across some of these uh, challenges. Okay, in terms of how the presentation is broken down today, um, I'm going to talk a bit about the problem, try and make you understand that there probably is a problem here in terms of benefits management. What does happen today, or rather what does not happen in some cases. Um, I'll sort of then try and paint a picture of what good looks like, uh, a bit of a vision, it's always good to start there, good to know where we're aiming for. Uh, then I'll talk about some of the challenges and solutions so some of the challenges that might stop us improving benefits management. And I'll talk about those in sort of four areas, really. A bit of POTI type analysis in terms of organization, process, tools, techniques, and information. And then, rather than just leave you with lots of ideas about what you might do to improve, I'll, I'll also then talk about how you can actually go about improving benefits management in your organizations. OK, let's get going then. So the problem. Uh, so I think there is a problem, it's not just me. There's quite a good quote here from the NEO when they were briefing the uh, PAC uh, quite recently last year. Um, it seems to say projects are really getting better at, if you like, managing performance, time and scope, but often overlook whether the project has realised uh, the intended benefits. So that's a very high level sweeping statement. Um, to break it down a bit and characterize that problem a little bit more. So I think the problem really has got three parts, start, middle, and end. So it's pretty poor all around, I guess you could say. Uh, in terms of the start, we often get off to a bad start. Uh, Over-optimism is one of the big ones. So there are other issues I'll come, come back to. Over-optimism at the outset, in terms of an overestimation, an overstatement of benefits. And then, you know, once a project, if it gets through its business case and into delivery, um, those benefits, whether they're right or wrong, can get eroded over time. Um, a lot of the life cycles, a lot of programs we deli uh, involve with are quite long. Change happens, and increasingly change happens. And if you don't keep your benefits up to date, they can erode and become disconnected what, with what the original objective was. And then at the end, if we su you know, survive to the finish line with some benefits intact, are often not realized by the target stakeholder groups that we're delivering into, whether we're delivering change or other project outputs. Uh, and so really, there's a, there's a whole series of things that happens which I'm going to now focus on a bit more. It's quite a fussy diagram, but I just wanted to, if you like, build on that uh, and really talk about a generic framework for benefits in the context of project program delivery and project program controls. Uh, that start, middle, and end bit, if you like. So right at the front, you know, there's a key role for benefits management in terms of identifying, quantifying, mapping the benefits uh, linked to the overall program project definition stage. And ideally, that should, should, you should use your benefits analysis to actually help shape and define 
um, the project scope and project options and obviously the analysis of those in, in the business case. Now, for those of you involved in public sector programmes, that's obviously firm green book territory we're talking about there, and it's the green blob around there. Then obviously you're into delivery, you've got through your business case. Um, obviously there's multiple delivery models out there depending on what thing you're delivering, whether you're delivering an IT system, whether you're delivering a nuclear submarine or a construction project. Um, but irrespective of those delivery models, you should really keep the analysis of benefits going. As I said, change happens. This is an important point to keep your benefits up to date. And actually, one of the things I think is not done as well in delivery stage is taking opportunities to validate, test uh, your benefits with your target users. And actually, this is one of the reasons I, I, talk, I like Agile and Agile principles. We'll come back to that. The opportunity to do things iteratively, to build a bit, test a bit, learn a lot, and get your users and stakeholders involved and feed that back into your benefits as a key aspect. And then at the end there, in terms of um, handing over to normal business operations and embedding the change or embedding the things you've delivered in a normal organization and then tracking and monitoring the realization of benefits. And obviously you might go around that cycle multiple times if you're in a, an iterative program. So that's the sort of framework and I've sort of, if you like, simplified it in this diagram. And I've now, if you like, built on that statement of what the problem is. Um, so at that definition stage, yes, it's about over-optimism, but it's more than that. It's often about oversimplification. It's often about data paucity, not having the data, not having the information on which to base your analysis of benefits. It's also about disparity and rigor. I keep return I'll return to this a few times. I would argue that some of those are excuses, really. You wouldn't get away with not analysing your costs for a business case and then managing your budget and your costs against your budget. But we seem to let people get away with it for benefits, and yet that is the purpose of the project or programme. So that's a cultural thing we might, might come back to. Uh, when we get in that middle stages, yeah, we, I mentioned it, long life cycles, and that itself is not necessarily a problem, but obviously a lot can change in that time, particularly on long, long public programmes. High Speed Rail 2 is a good example, a lot can change. So that ability to make sure your benefits are kept up to date and ideally finding ways to verify and validate those with your users as you go along and somehow break down that delivery. And then at the end, uh, some of the problems really come, come down to a basic lack of accountability. It's not always clear who's on the hook for realizing benefits. The change is often not embedded into the organisations. There's often poor integration, and what I mean by that is you might have multiple projects, programmes going on, you're delivering into your business as usual organisation at the same time. Are they all coherent? Are they all going to be delivered at the same time? How do they link together? Who's doing that planning? And as we mentioned, you know, benefits not tracked. Uh, often benefits can go on a long time after a project programme close. How do you track them? How do you track them as part of your normal performance management systems? Okay, before we go further, so I also assume everyone knows what I'm talking about, which is not always the case. So I thought I'd put some uh, definitions up there about benefits and benefits management. They're fairly standard these days. Um, the first one, though, I think is a, is a very useful reminder of what a benefit is. Some key words in there about measurable, must be measurable. And the links to stakeholders and organisational objectives is key as well. I think a lot of problems creep in there. Um, a benefit by its nature must be perceived as an advantage to a stakeholder. So if you haven't got your stakeholders bought by into those benefits, then you can't claim them as a benefit. It's pretty basic. And likewise, the linkage to organisational objectives and strategy. So hopefully those definitions aren't a surprise to you. And I'm also going to use, as I've said, this sort of capability framework for the rest of the talk, really, to characterise both some of the challenges and some of the sort of, if you like, practical ways we might overcome them based on, on my experience. OK, enough about wallowing in the problems. Let's think about what the green uplands look like. I mean, what, what is good in, in benefit management terms? At a very high level, I think this, uh, I think this statement captures it, really, for me. Um, it's in, originally in the Guide for uh, Managing Successful Programs, 
and it's been repeated again in the IPA's recent um, launch of their uh, effective benefits management guide in, in major projects. It's all about bringing benefits into the heart of delivering projects and programmes successfully. OK, that's very high level, so it doesn't necessarily help us um, work out what to do about it. So this slide unpacks that in a bit more detail. And really, these are my definitions of, based on experience of doing this, of what good benefits management looks like. And I've broken it into those four areas of organisation, process, tools, techniques, and, and information. In terms of organisation, it's about, in my experience, objective benefits, benefits evidence generated by experienced professionals, used to support decision-making, aligned to clear responsibilities and accountabilities. In terms of processes, yep, yeah, they need to be fit for purpose, and they need to be embedded, and they need to be integrated with your wider project program management processes, and actually some of your business as usual processes as well. Uh, in terms of tools, techniques, um, in terms of process, sorry, it's all about the ability to identify, analyse, quantify, profile and track benefits, a bit of a mouthful, but importantly through the life cycle, and we'll turn to that in a minute, and the ability to deal with risk, uncertainty and dependencies, just like any other aspect of a programme, at an appropriate level of rigour and complexity for the, the endeavour you're embarking on. In terms of information and data, yeah, it needs to be appropriate and measurable, back to that word measurable again, with appropriate metrics uh, aligned to the values and business and its stakeholders uh, and integrated into the performance management systems of the organisation. Another good quote there again uh, from the recent IPA guide on benefits management. So I'm going to unpack that a little bit and explain why I think those are the important things of what we need to try and achieve. So. First, I'm going to talk about uh, the way I'm going to structure this, if you like, the meat of the presentation is talking about some of the challenges to, that might stop us getting to there, what, putting that vision in place, my, my vision for benefits management, and some of the sort of solutions we might think about to address those in terms of some practical do's and don'ts. Um, and again, another good quote there from the PMI, and I particularly like the words um, purposeful attention. Because um, I think that's ultimately what it's about. It's about properly and professionally applying some rigour to, to benefits and bringing it much more into the heart of um, normal project programme uh, management. So I've mentioned the IPA's um, Effective Benefits Management Guide a couple of times now. Uh, and actually when I... I suppose it's fortuitous that it happened to come out roughly at the same time as I decided to do this. They weren't interlinked. I did decide to do this presentation before they released their guide. But actually, it's quite a useful um, uh, coincidence, if you like. And I did pluck out these challenges they, they put in their guide. There's a direct read of some of the challenges that the IPA expressed for public, uh, complex public programmes. Um, and I've, I've tagged them against those areas where there are organisational issues or process issues, etc. Uh, I won't read them all out, but I, they do chime very well with um, what I've just been talking about, and they do chime very well with my own experience. And indeed, um, I will, there's some things I now get on to are really about how we uh, address those challenges. And as you see there, there's quite a smattering of things, but actually, I, I would contend, I would assert, I guess, that a lot of those are down to mainly organisational issues and information. I think they're the two biggest blockers to effective benefits management, and I'll be, I'll be majoring on those for the rest of the talk. Okay, so you're going to see a odd Dilbert appear as we go along. I'm not that great at jokes, but I think um, they always make me smile anyway, um, and I think they're often very apt. So we're talking about organisational stuff. I think, this is, to me, this is the most important area, and because it is, I'm just going to, going to break down the problem space a little bit more, because I think there are three main parts to this that, are, that affect how we can do benefits management. Uh, I did catch the, uh, I don't know if some of you are here for the, for the previous speaker talking about ethics and culture. I did uh, catch the end of her thing, and that's a nice sort of segue into what I'm talking about here, really. And I guess culturally, it depends whether you subscribe to this conspiracy theory or incompetence theory. 
Um, I like to describe to the latter, really, because I think generally people try to do the right thing. They might make some wrong decisions on the way um, for, for what they would say the right reason. And these are the sort of often you get, are the arguments you get, because people are so, if you like, committed to the, to the solution they've developed or the approach, and they're passionate about it. They'll often, I guess, push things through. Thinks too, it's obvious we should be doing this. Everyone else is doing it, so why wouldn't we? Um, or, you know, we've already got a head of steam. It's too late. Why, why are you talking to me about benefits? We know what we're doing. Another good one, in my experience, is to make it too big to cancel. Uh, I think we used to call that entryism in the MOD. Um, get in there, make it bigger, and then it gets such a head of steam that no one's, no one's prepared to cancel it. And it's too difficult. Oh, yeah, the benefits. We all know we need benefits, but it's too complex, really. Um, again, reinforcing that. It's the right thing to do. We just need to get on and do it. Everyone likes delivering. Um, so sometimes you're, you're, you're um, challenging some, some cultural blockers there. Um, but then there's some very basic stuff as well. You know, governance, just good governance over benefits and making sure that, as I said before, there's parity with the rigour in which you would, you would apply to cost estimating and cost forecasting analysis, um, clear accountabilities and incentives on a range of um, people, not just those involved in delivery, but those in the business who will actually be responsible for realising the benefits from these, uh, what you're delivering. And last but not least, people. Um, and that's really about professionalism, really. I think ultimately, we need to professionalise it more. Again, I'll link back to what we do on costs. Do we do benefits as rigorously? Uh, we need people who can do that sort of level of analysis. OK. So in terms of organisational issues, here's my sort of list of do's and don'ts. Uh, this is a, bit, a little bit higher level than the IPA guide, but I thought it would be useful to put up some more practical. So at least some of the things I would say we should do and not to do to, to tackle those organisational issues. So definitely do create a pull for benefits analysis and information. That needs to come from the top. We should demand good analysis and objective evidence. And do talk with evidence and expect people to talk with evidence and test their assertions. Do embed benefits management at all levels in project programme portfolio management and in the relevant programme project portfolio offices. That's about bringing that, that, that theme about bringing it into the heart of um, project to programme delivery. Do test and counteract that optimism. And assurance is an important part of that. Um, as I mentioned before, embrace agile principles and behaviour. So I've put this here in organisation because I'm talking not about detailed agile methodologies here like Scrum and DSEM. I'm talking about agile principles and behaviour. I'm talking about having those adopted at your organisational level, some of those things about involving users and stakeholders early on, about um, breaking things down if you possibly can into, into smaller parts, and learning, learning by doing, and uh, feeding that back into your analysis of benefits. Um, do professionalise and recognise benefits management in your organisation. And there's a lot on that in the IPA guide about that, and I think there's a lot of good stuff in there. And I think they have as well developed some sets of competencies and skill profiles to go with that. And do hold someone to account for realisation of benefits. And that should normally be, as the don't point says on the other side, someone outside the project or programme, someone in the business. Um, MSP use this term benefits um, Change Band, BCM, is it? I think they call it. It doesn't really matter. It should be someone in the business. It should, someone should have one of those stakeholders, one or more of those stakeholders you identify uh, for the benefits. And some of the don'ts. So don't avoid questions you might not like the answer to. Um, don't make the PM accountable for benefits realisation. There should be a natural tension on a, on a programme board between the, the programme manager and the people in the business who are getting that. That's a healthy tension. Don't wait until the business case to develop benefits profiles. So I mentioned about it's not just for the business case, but actually it should start as early as possible. It's about getting in there early and shaping the uh, analysis and shaping the definition of the project or programme. 
Don't finalise the scope of the project without validating it against the benefits. And don't oversimplify. Understand the wider context and the change in environment. And we'll come back to some, some ways you might do that in a minute. OK, in terms of processes, I mean, I actually don't think this is quite as important, but um, another good deal but there, I think, to you can just dwell on a minute. Perhaps a little bit uh, slightly cynical there, but I think there's an important point for me, which is, you know, that we're sometimes caught in the, in, in the spotlight of these good methodologies and new ways of doing things, whether it's agile or lean, etc. But they in themselves often are just collections of good practice. And what you find is there are people already doing good things. Good people will do good things irrespective of process. So building on that, so process, yeah, do have one. Do have a benefits management process. But make sure it is fit for purpose and aligned to the needs of your organization. People just won't use it. Um, do make sure it's communicated, accessible, and transparent, which often they are. Don't write it down in a 500-page document and expect to uh, people to understand it or read it. Do make sure it has ownership and buy-in at a senior level. And do make sure it spans the life cycle into business as usual. And make sure it is monitored and controlled by the program office or project support office, etc. And don't believe because it is written down, people will read it. I am Maybe I'm of a generation where I expect people to read things, but I've, I come to the realization that generally people don't read stuff. So you need to find other ways to communicate it and get the message across. Um, don't define it as a standalone discipline. Make sure it is integrated into uh, other processes, such as risk management in particular and change management. I've mentioned that before. It should be an integral part of any change evaluation, change decision. Don't believe that having a process will solve all your problems. I almost said that. Don't make it a one-pass process. So it should be iterative, and I'll come back to that. It should be iterative through the life cycle. In fact, our very own process, BMT's process for doing this when we go into clients, it's fairly standard steps. We actually include an extra step called understand the system. And that's really because we think um, you need a really good foundation if you're dealing with complex projects. You really need to understand both the problem space and the potential solutions and how they interlink. Uh, and if you don't get that understanding up front and use the understanding within the project program team, you're off to a bad start. But the main thing I want to get across here is cyclical. And you should go around this process at key points in the program project lifecycle. And also in response to major change, whether it's an external change or an internal change. So, um, don't just do it once for the business case. Back to my theme. Keep doing it. OK, on to um, tools and techniques. Another good deal but there. I'm not sure that's uh, an effective benefits technique there, but I suppose it's one you could use. Um, but here's a few more practical ones from my experience. So, benefits map. So, I think the benefits map is really important. I don't think they're used enough, and I don't think they're used um, as powerfully as they can be. In my experience, uh, they're one of the most powerful tools in a project and program if you get them right and you get the buy-in, which you should. And often, I, I argue, they should be used as a plan on a page. I mean, I see a lot of very dry plans on a page with a lot of, you know, very high-level Gantt chart with some milestones on. They tell you what project or program is doing, but they don't tell you why. And they don't tell you and communicate why that's important to stakeholders. Whereas a benefits map, if you get it right, tells you instantly why you're doing that, and it links what you're doing in terms of your project program delivery to the effects on the business. And more than that, it actually you know, puts stakeholders against each of those, those outcomes or benefits, and therefore it's a very powerful communication tool. And if you develop that with stakeholders, and get their buy-in, it's even more important. Um, and like I said, under that, do engage stakeholders as much as possible. They must own the benefits, and they must buy into them. And indeed, some will be accountable for their realization. Some of the tool vendors might not thank me for saying this, but in my experience, in most cases, fairly standard office applications are usually sufficient. Same, really, for cost analysis. You know, most finance people use 
use Excel. It's a standard tool. Uh, actually, for benefits management, it's very similar. Don't be lulled into believing that tools will make up for poor data, though, and I'll come back to that when I talk about information and data. Don't ignore benefits-based dependencies. Um, this is another good one that I think often is missed in programs. Um, we often talk about dependencies from a, what I call a logical sense. So, you know, I can't do that bit of my program and deliver that output unless I get that, you know, input from someone else. I'm talking about here in outcome terms. So, if you're going to realize the benefits, what other things are your, your, your work or your outcomes, your program dependent on, both within your, your project program and wider? And understand those and manage those dependencies like any other dependency. So don't be put off by complexity. This, this sort of thing I said earlier about, oh, it's all too difficult. There are tools and techniques out there you can use to deal with that complexity. Some drawn from, you know, probably skills that are in the project or program anyway, um, like systems and uh, approaches, modeling, etc. And also in terms of cost analysis techniques, uh, like dealing with risk and uncertainty in estimates. They're all standard techniques and there's if you're right, no uh, excuse for not using them to do benefits. And don't wait until project handover, if you can possibly avoid it, to verify and validate your benefits. I mentioned that earlier. Try to get ways to test and validate those during delivery, delivery and then you can optimise your, your outputs to, to get the most benefit out of what you finally deliver. OK, last but by no means least, uh, information. Well, sorry, I'll just talk about the benefits map first. I realise that. Yeah, you're not supposed to read this, by the way. In fact, I, I actually don't want you to read that. There's some things on there you're not supposed to see. Uh, but essentially, I just, I just want to put this across that that's what a benefit map can look like. They can be quite complex. Um, but I said they're very powerful because each of, the, each of the projects on there and the outputs we're delivering link through to benefits. And they're all owned by a stakeholder. And you can track anyone through from, from start to finish. What's more, the three on the top there were the sort of projects in the program we were interested in and mapping, but actually the ones in, 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 um, in the box below, the five other projects, were other projects that were being delivered elsewhere in the organisation that all had a dependency on, on us, or vice versa, and this is back to this point about dependency. So once you've mapped all the other projects in there, you can understand things like uh, the interrelationship and what would happen if one of those projects got cancelled, how would that affect your benefits and vice versa, uh, and quite important. And also another key aspect of that is a time-based analysis and understanding of things. You might be delivering your output in 10 years' time. If another project's coming along and changing your benefits baseline before that, you can't use the one today, you've got to use the one that you predict is going to be there in 10 years' time. So let's like say a powerful tool if you can get it right and get stakeholders bought into. So yeah, so now the bit I was going to talk about, which is, uh, which is information. Final deal, but you'll be glad to know. Um, I guess, how do we get around those absurd claims of value and benefit? How do we actually talk with evidence? How do we make our benefits objective? So the last set of do's and don'ts. Um, so do make sure you understand the baseline. Uh, we've talked about that already. Make sure you understand the baseline, not only today, but when you're going to be delivering, more importantly. Do quantify risk and uncertainty in benefits. There will be a lot, but that doesn't mean it's all too difficult. That means you use, need to use the right techniques to understand and allow for risk and uncertainty in your estimates and your forecasts. Link to that, do undertake sensitivity and scenario analysis, sort of stress test your benefits against various things, including, like I say, some of those dependencies. Do understand and adjust for optimum bi optimism bias. The IPA major on this, as you'd expect, it's, um, it's something they do in, in cost appraisals, but you need to do it just as well in, in benefits appraisals, and probably more so, because that's where optimism is more likely to uh, creep in, as I mentioned earlier. So do use, try and use a mixture of leading and lagging, lagging and care. What I mean by that, in terms of benefits, you know, it's very easy to lull yourself into thinking, well, we can't measure them till after we've delivered, and therefore there's nothing we can do about it. Actually, there are things you can often measure as a leading indicator. 
and do align measures to the value of the business and its stakeholders. Uh, and that should happen. If you engage stakeholders in the process, you should get alignment in terms of how you measure your benefits with what they think is important. Uh, don't waste effort on things that can't and won't be measured. By definition, if you can't measure it, it's not a benefit. If you can't measure it today, though, it's a slightly different thing. One thing you might consider is whether you need to put measures in place. Although I would ask the question, if your organisation doesn't measure it today, how important really is it? Don't believe that your baseline today, I've said that already, will be your baseline when you come to realise your benefits. And don't just forecast them for the business case. They should be regularly updated in, in response to major changes. And don't ignore the disbenefits. Uh, very easy to do. We also want to give a, uh, and that's why often benefits are over optimistic. There will be disbenefits. They will come out if you engage your stakeholders properly. Nature of change is you usually disenfranchise someone, and therefore you need to capture those just as much as those that you are, you are benefiting. Uh, in terms of the advantage, because they need to be managed and mitigated just like a risk. They are a benefits-based risk. Okay, and again, something you're not supposed to read, but it just looks a bit pretty, I guess. Just to show the point that if you do this right, and, and indeed this is an example where we were asked initially just to do a cost forecast, a cost analysis on a programme, but we applied exactly the same te techniques to doing a benefits analysis and benefits forecast based on that earlier benefits map I showed you. And, you know, we incorporated risk and uncertainty analysis, we incorporated sensitivity analysis, dependencies between project programs. It all can be done. It's difficult, but it can be done. Okay. Um, just check my time. Yeah, okay, I think. Just that last bit of the presentation, I was just going to leave you with some um, ideas for how you might go about improving benefits in your organisation, wherever you might come from, where you might start, um, because I've been preaching a lot about what to do and what not to do, but that doesn't really necessarily help you if you don't know how, what to take back and how to, how to improve things. And so the first thing I'd say is, is regard improving benefits management like a change in its own right. And that's why I put up that famous Machiavelli quote about how difficult change is to implement. So don't underestimate it, don't underestimate how difficult it will be and therefore get the buy-in, get the senior buy-in you need to, to, to move that forward. And actually, the only thing I would really say on this is, and you've probably got the hint of this by what I've been talking about already, I would always start with the organisation. Uh, those cultural issues will always stop you unless you, you do tackle them, and they take the longest to overcome. It's the old Chinese water treatment you need to... Persist, keep on at that until it becomes the normal way of business in your organisation. Do make sure you have very clear roles and responsibilities across the whole P3 organisation and wider business governance. Do make sure people are held to account, create the pull, because as soon as someone's held to account, they will naturally pull the need for benefits management and pull the, the need for information. Do you recognise and professionalise the discipline, depending on how big you are, how big an organisation, it's important to professionalise it just as you do with other disciplines. Uh, do lead from the top, do agree and, agree and embed principles, and other things like processes can follow. And likewise, a bit of a pincer movement, I would say, if you've got the ability, do also try and improve your information. It's back to this talking with evidence, the two tend to go hand in hand. If you get the governance right and the culture right, and you've got evidence to beat people over the head with, basically, in terms of your benefits, it does help. Um, so demand that parity of rigour for cost analysis and forecasting. Um, and do drive consistency of metrics down from the portfolio level, if any of you are involved with portfolio officers. Um, and as I said, do identify and manage those benefits-based dependencies. Do build the knowledge base. Drive your performance reporting AMI system so they can track benefits, and they do track benefits. And do use those tools and techniques I talked about in terms of dealing with complexity, risk, etc. But in, in, in essence, all I'm saying here is do manage it as a change project in its own right. In, in a rather recursive sort of argument, make sure you realise the benefits of doing benefits management better. Okay, a very quick sum summary. 
Well, I've misspelled managing. That's good. No matter how, time, how many times you read anything. So yes. So managing time, cost, and scope once the business case has been proved is necessary but not sufficient, I would argue. Do bring benefits management in the heart of project programme decision making. And also do try and bring it up to a parity with cost and time analysis and control. Do demand and expect evidence behind benefits claims. Do embrace agile principles if you can. I'm talking about agile principles here again, not detailed agile methodologies. They may not be appropriate. So yes, build a bit, test a bit, learn a lot if you can possibly do that. And I know it's not always the case. You can't build a bit of a nuclear submarine. It's not that easy, although there are things you can build on. Um, and do involve users and stakeholders as you go along. Don't lose the link between scope and benefits. Evaluate the benefits impact of all internal and external change. And do address those cultural barriers and manage it as a change initiative. OK, that's it. So hopefully, if you do all that, you'll avoid the, the benefits miracle, as it says there. Uh, so that's just about what I was going to say. So if anyone's got any, any questions they want to ask me, please fire ahead. And, and if you do, please. Uh, Put your hand up and then stand up so the cameraman can get a good shot of you. You mentioned some IPA guide. Is that the best uh, guide for implementing uh, benefits management in an organisation? Or is there anything, any, anything that could help somebody that's been asked to do such a task? Yeah, the IPA is just really hot off the press. In fact, I don't know if you're a member of the APM or are you? Or? I, I, I was and I probably will be okay. in again in the future. Okay, the APM, uh, the, the, the IPA just did a big um, webinar on it as well through the APM, uh, so that's available to look at. But yeah, you can, you can just Google it and find it. I, I've, I've quoted it in my presentation, which I think you'll be getting a copy of. But that's probably one of the best ones I've seen. If you're involved in public programs, of course, because it is quite angled to public programs, although there's some good general advice um, and guidance in there anyway, even if you're in a, in a private sector organization. But there are others as well. I mean, the, the classic one is the Steve Jenner APMG publication. That's probably the, um, the best guide that's been out there for a while. That goes into more depth. Okay. Um, and there's bits and pieces on it in things like managing successful programs. But I would say the IPA guide's free, so why not start there? I think you have yeah, to pay I, for the Steve Jenner one. I, I tried using the MSP one, but it didn't quite go far enough to keep my managers happy. It, it, uh, it just briefly touched on the subject. Yeah, and that's the problem with the MSP. It tells you a lot of, of what you need to do, but it doesn't tell you how. Um, so the Steve Jenner book does go into how, it does go into tools, techniques, methods, some of the stuff I've touched on here, how to do a benefits map. Um, and, and the IPA guide, which is, uh, say it's free, so you might want to start there, does go into that as well. So okay. yeah, I would recommend starting there, certainly. Thanks. Yeah, how do you quantify uh, benefits that aren't financial, like nobody's going to die? or less people are going to get hurt, that kind of thing? That is a good question, and it's, it, is, it is difficult. It is very difficult. Um, I would say by saying most organisations, certainly private, can usually relate um, it in some way to a financial cost. I mean, I did some work at EDF, one of those examples I gave was at EDF, uh, and actually you can usually bring even, you know, scary nuclear accidents back to, to a monetary value. But in some cases you can't, you know, some of the things I know, like more social-based reforms in public sector, um, you do need to find appropriate metrics. And, and there are some good non-financial non metrics out there. There is, in fact, a good publication that's been put out. I'm in part of the benefits management specific in interest group in the APM. Uh, and there's a publication they put out called, I think it's called SROI. It's a, is a methodology for, I forget what the SROA stands for, that. it's social return on investment it's called, and it gives some very good metrics and ways of measuring social impacts as opposed to, um, and societal impacts as opposed to pure financial impacts. Um, so yeah, again, you know, I would just say don't use it as an excuse, I mean there are metrics, engage with your stakeholders, often they will, will, will help you come up with the right metrics anyway. Um, but there are some guides out there as well, and that's one I do now, the SROI guide, and I can give me a card after I can send you a link to that. You mentioned uh, organisational culture and challenges around that. 
Why do you believe there is a, an issue between benefits realization, measurement, and, and culture within business? Well, again, I, it's probably, I, some of what I've done is quite a, quite a sweeping statement. I think in some organisations it's probably better than others. You would think generally in private sector organisations it would be better. And ultimately, you're investing your shareholders' money. Someone's going to hold you to account that you've spent that properly and that you get a return on that investment. So generally, it is better in private organisations. Um, but not always. You know, sometimes you get the, uh, the pet project. Someone has a passion for for some particular thing that they've maybe seen work somewhere else and, and, and want to do it. So there's a whole bunch of, of reasons, uh, I think. Um, some of which I hinted at there. You probably do get it more in public sector programs. Um, and I say, sometimes it's just, it's, it, the MOD used to call it a conspiracy of optimism. I don't know if they've used that in other programs. So people are generally trying to do the right thing. And because they believe they're on, on, do, trying to do the right thing, they make poor decisions, or if you like, they turn a blind eye unwittingly to, to uh, asking evidence. And that's why I think you need objectivity, and that's very difficult to bring. I think you need to bring it in through good techniques, but you also need assurance. And the IPA's guide goes a lot into that on, on, on how you bring in independent assurance as well, a big program. So, yeah, it's probably not a neat answer to why you get these cultural blockers. I've just observed they are there, and I say generally it's because people are trying to do what they believe is the right thing passionately, but you've got to get dispassionate about that and, and actually get some objectivity into that decision making. Are there any particular techniques that you have in mind to drive engagement in benefits in very long programmes where it's unlikely that any of the people there at the start of the exercise will be there and ac accountable for the benefits at the end and trying to realise them? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, probably no silver bullet to that, but certainly um, a lot of public programmes can be very long, effectively infrastructure programmes, etc. Uh, and, you know, there's usually a high turnover of staff, so that can be a problem. But, I mean, I think that comes down to basic knowledge management that you get in, in anywhere. I mean, if you keep those benefits up to date and you do it periodically and routine, there should be no reason why... Um, you lose that continuity in your analysis of benefits. And you do need to do it, because even with long-run programs, in fact, it's more important to do it in those, those long life cycle programs, keeping in stakeholders engaged, because stakeholders will change. And remember, benefits are in the eye of the stakeholder in, 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 in that definition I've had earlier. So you might, you might be frustrated by it, but if your stakeholders change, you need to go around the boy again and revalidate them with your new stakeholders, because their perceptions will change just because purely things like they're influenced by society, they're influenced by technology expectations. So it's, it's not sufficient just to do that once. You need to keep doing it at, at, at key points through the program, and especially if you've got a long, a long life cycle. And look for ways to break that down. Look for ways to get some stuff out early. You know, change program, they call it quick wins. Agile, we'll call it, you know iterative sort of releases, some way of getting some stuff out if you can. I know it's not always possible. OK, I think we're well, I'm getting the one-minute sign, so I think uh, we may got quite an uh, opportunity for one last question. Otherwise, um, please, please feel free to come and talk to me after. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>